Good, beautiful day, beautiful, beautiful souls. I'm so grateful to have you with us today here. This is on Charla Anderson, host of the Charla Anderson Show, collector and connector of fascinating people. And everyone is fascinating, especially you. I'm so grateful to have you here. We're on Win Win Women platform. We're on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Podetize with podcasting soon to be out there everywhere and I'm so grateful that you would take the time to take a listen here it's May 24th 2023 and I'm going to do my little breathing exercise that I do at the beginning of every show and and after that then I'm going to introduce you to one of the most incredible people in my personal life my niece beautiful niece Emily Hooks and we'll learn all about we're actually going to both of us were there when she was kidnapped so we're going to come back in and share some of that story and share the story of redemption around all that so first we're going to start with our little breathing exercise it's like a 22 second mini vacation uh, a little mini meditation and it's we're going to breathe in for seven seconds calmness calm we're going to hold for four seconds and then we're going to breathe out gratitude for 11 seconds so join me with that and then we'll get on with our show so here we go breathing in calm hold breathe out gratitude release thank you thank you thank you Thank you. So thank you. I hope that that is a reminder to you and all of us that we uh, can use a little centering, a little grounding, get off our devices a minute and just be reconnected, right, to ourselves. So that's why I do that. And today, this is an incredible honor for me. I have known this person her whole life. (laughs) Um, My niece, Emily Hooks, has an incredible story. And uh, we, you know, just to throw it out there, she was kidnapped when she was seven years old. She was re-kidnapped. We went and re-kidnapped her when she was 11, I believe, three years later, give or take. And that story sent her a little bit on a path after after a while down a path of destruction and then back to redemption and forgiveness so emily i love you i'm so grateful that you're here tell us just a speck of who you are and who uh what you're doing in this world right now doing in the world right now well my name is emily hooks as charla mentioned i am her niece her sister's daughter um And, you know, I'm a writer. Um, I wrote and published a book uh, called The Power of Forgiveness, A Guide to Healing and Wholeness in 2017. And I am working on, and there it is. Uh, I'm working on another book now on self-forgiveness that has been much more difficult to write, if I'm being honest. But, um, you know, as the universe is apt to do, anything I didn't know, I've been learning. (laughs) (laughs) And you said self-forgiveness? Yes. Oh, that. Yeah, just that little, (laughs) you know, it's interesting. I, in the first book, I said that uh, there were just a few distinctions between the two, and I, those were not incorrect distinctions, but there were actually quite a few differences that I didn't highlight in that book, so I'm eager to, to set the record straight and share this book with the world, hopefully next year. I was going to say time frame. So next year, mm-hmm. it, it's a process, right? I mean, yeah. somebody <laughs> needs to put me on the hook. <laughs> okay. I, was on I the got, hook I got my watch <laughs> here. We can, we're counting down, counting down. So let's get her done. I mean, you're, the story it is such a needed topic. It's just yeah. such a needed topic. I believe um, gratitude and forgiveness actually are probably the two keys to everything yes. if you want to live in peace and freedom I mean that's it you know I think those everything else goes under that and so you and when we say forgiveness we're talking about we're talking about forgiving God or your creator you're forgiving 
yourself and then the others. It really is almost, it's almost got to go in that order, but you're the expert on that. Is that your finding too? Um, um, well, you know, I think that if that's what's true for you and for um, anybody who's engaging in the healing process, then that's a great way to approach it. I don't think it's uh, inherently true that um, um, the creator or one's creator, one's God, the universe, whatever you believe in, um, needs to intervene. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to say because people spend lifetimes waiting for uh, divine intervention. And that's, that's a real um, sacrifice to make. We get to choose how we're gonna live our lives. And while it, it is significantly more difficult to engage in the healing process without that, um, it's still possible, so. I, I agree. And what, what I think I would like to add, because that model that I said earlier, you know, at first was, now I've come to know that really we are, we are the creator of our own lives, right? God, that, you know, that that's part of the self-forgiveness is what I'm going to perhaps put out mm -hmm. there. Who knows? Right. Yes, so, absolutely. So that seems to, that seems a, a new thought for me. So good. That's yes. amazing. Yeah. You know, that really is a primary focus of this next book. It, it in, in some ways it's, it, a lot of what I'm saying is counter to the co the the modern ethos around you know mind over matter, um, and so it's it's been interesting to kind of explore what my personal experience has been, and what the research shows, independent of that sort of overlay um, about you know you know, follow your bliss and the universe is, you know, the universe has your back and all of those things. I mean, they sound beautiful and I really want them to be true. But if in practice, that's not your experience, I think it's important to, um, to know that you still have a valid experience. You're not doing it wrong. You know, it's not possible to do life wrong. It's just possible that you're not doing it in a way that's creating joy and happiness. And and connect. Don't we want that, right? I mean, yes. so I think so many people want it and are clueless about what that means and how to how mm -hmm. to do that. Emily, you were born soulful. You're the most. <laughs> you are. You're probably one of the most soulful, deep thinkers. You know, just really an old soul from your youth, and and you have a son like that as well. Amazing Zach, who we love so much, and. Uh, we have a story to tell, and I think what would most people are going to be uh, most interested in here is um, let's tell this story because you were beautiful. You were raised in a small town. My sister, your mom, Shirley, had uh, Kathy, your sister, and then you, and had a nice life in Granbury, Texas, doing real estate in whatever back in the 80s, seven, late 70s and 80s, and something happened. Mm -hmm. One day you didn't come home. Mm -hmm. And when you don't come home at seven years old, there's a gap. <laughs> there's a huge missing piece in our yes. lives, our lives. Yes. And our focus for a lot of years then was trying to figure out where you were and how you were making sure you were okay. So can you, do you want to tell a little bit about that sure. piece? As you know, this time goes really fast. So I know it does. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I was born at 733. No. <laughs> no, we won't do all that. I do want to just reframe a little bit before we get started and say that um, I think as I think even more so than from my experience. So, you know, we can get to the chaos that I re reaped later in my life uh, after we tell this part of the story. But that chaos really wasn't reaped solely because of this event. I think uh, the familial trauma, you know, the experience that you all had of me not coming home, that's more singular. 
Um, but my trauma is much more complex than just this one event or the two events that we're going to talk about. Uh, and I think that's really important to acknowledge. Um, so yeah, so I was seven years old and my dad, who was British, uh, he's since passed, um, was living um, uh, in Boston. And he called mom and asked if he could take me for the Easter vacation. It was April 10th or 11th. 1979. And she agreed. Um, and so he flew down to Texas and picked me up and took me to Boston. Um, he subsequently took me out of the country. Um, and he called my mom's house, my house uh, in our small town, and uh, left a message for her saying that she would never see me again. And that if she tried to find us, he would tell me that she was dead. And that I think knowing that little piece is important to a window into understanding sort of the, the mental illness uh, and twisted way of seeing the world that my father experienced. Uh, and that, that, that's real. He was, you know, in some ways, uh, he was an important part of my development in a positive way, believe it or not, but he was also a very unwell human being. Um, and he, he really uh, created chaos for my mom, uh, which is the most heartbreaking part of the story. Um, so anyway, he took me out of the country and I don't really actually remember that, that how we got out of the country. Um, and then subsequently mom started searching, um, contacting the FBI. Um, I don't know if you want me to keep moving forward in this story, but one thing that's interesting um, um, as I, do some research on exactly what happened. Um, there wasn't really any recourse that mom could take when it initially happened, but something interesting happened during the period I was gone, which was 79 to 82. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that is that the Hague, Conven Hague Convention was signed. And specifically what the Hague Convention is, is it's, a, it's an international treaty that says that uh, uh, custody agreements in countries who are signed into the treaty have to honor the other members' custody agreements. So prior to that, the United States in 1980 signing that, and they didn't start utilizing it until 1981, prior to that, there was literally no recourse that my mother could take because they didn't believe I was in the country. So it's interesting. So, and then, and the also, it, it, I'm sorry, say that again. I said it's interesting to tap into that historical piece of it. That's true. And that's a piece that I don't, you know, was out of my realm, you know, wasn't really paying attention to that as much. I mean, we were all desperate sure. looking for you. And, and another thing to think about that really was an issue was what if we got you back, you know, when we got you back. And this was a little bit later on when we found out that uh, where you were, that you were out of the country, but Getting, you didn't have a passport. I mean, there was a lot of things that were having to go on and we were in writing letters. There was Jim Wright, the Speaker of the House. There were so many pe people that were looking for you and, yes. and assisting in that process. And, you know, you're a mother, I'm a mother and, and I can't fathom yeah. missing my, having my child disappear mm -hmm. and then be threatened that, you would be told she was dead so that 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 manipulation that that horrific um yeah uh, over overcurrent of all of it is really devastating and so you were in you ended up in a boarding school in England is what I understand right so if we just do that Story. Towards the towards the end of my tenure, the tenure there, I was in a boarding school. I actually went to five different schools while I was there. At the time, I wasn't understanding why that was, but uh, retrospectively, he was obviously trying to hide me. He didn't know what what was happening on your side of the of 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 the world as far as looking for me and being active in the country over there. So, yeah, I I but I did end up on the Welsh border in a small uh, boarding school. So. And then uh, my perspective, here I was, I'm, you know, um, I'm your aunt and I, we were in Houston and, and your mom was up uh, in a small town in North Texas. And we, 
you know, it was, it was not in my face every day, but it was in my heart. Right. And so I ran across a book and I got very spiritually uh, minded in the beginning of 1982. And I was, uh, you know, as a flight attendant, I was traveling and back and forth, but I ran across a tiny book and I looked for it. I was hoping I could find it to just show, but um, The Power of Positive Praying oh. by John Bassanio. And that little book gave me a different perspective on praying in that we already know God's will in most things. Pray what you know, mm. instead of if it be, no, we know, we knew, I knew. And so in that process, I found this book to go, I was like, okay, I am, I know for a fact it's God's will or it, it is important that you know we are looking for you and we love you. Mm -hmm. I knew for a fact it was important that we knew you were okay wherever you are. I didn't know if it was a, if it was better for you where you were, where we were. I didn't I didn't go there. That wasn't part of the my equation. But I I was I started this thought and this prayer that you must have to know that we love you and we have to know you're okay. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, the, you get, you get words sometimes, you get an answer, you get a, an insight sometimes that, and I got this word that we're going to know, we're going to have you back by your birthday. <laughs> and I didn't have the guts to say that out loud. I had the guts to say to your mom, I was like, I believe we'll hear from her by your birthday on your birthday on your birthday we found out that you were what country you were in that you're in england and um i was like man if i had had the faith to speak what i had heard i think we would have had you back somehow by then i don't you know i don't know but it's the way it worked out and immediately we went into action on my, our part and yes. as a flight attendant i had the um pass i i was able to travel with your mom uh, easier than a lot of other people could have. And um, we ended up flying over to England and we had, we had a, an, another guy with us, a, an investigator kind of guy. And he, yes. you know, but we had two cars and we were trading cars and we were in trench coats and we were in, you know, I mean, it was, it was this spy novel thing in a way it was it was yeah. bizarre but we didn't know where you were but we ultimately got hints and somehow figured out that you were where you were up near the Wales border and we found we went and stole a, a, a phone book a phone book and you know the old phone books it wasn't that thick it was about this thick and we tore it in thirds and we had a phone number and we just started looking down, looking for phone numbers, looking for a phone number, looking for that phone number. And I believe it was your mom that saw it first. And and uh, then it got really interesting because, uh, you know, we kidnapped you back <laughs> and right. literally knocked on the door of this. You're at a friend's house. We kidnapped you back. We they went. You went to the your mom went to the door, grabbed you. You were in your nightgown. I don't think you had anything else. That's right. We threw you oh, in the car dad. that you saw. I was at a, I was at a mo at the hotel kind of, uh, with the other car and we left that we traded cars and went down and, um, got pulled over, went to, <laughs> we got caught, caught by the police. You know, here we are in England and we, we got, uh, um, arrested. Well, we arrested. Got, well, I, arrested. you know, or we, it, didn't it, get arrested. we didn't get arrested, but we got detained. So maybe that's a better word and, and went to jail. And then they gave us, um, actually gave us the grace to have a, a, a hotel room with a, with a guard outside of it, the little bobbies with their hats and, yeah, and right. stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, then they were, we were told this, that if I'm not mistaken, that was July 4th. 1982. It was, it was, yeah, we went to court on July 5th and flew back to Houston on July 6th. So, but uh, the, that was a miracle in and of itself because the court docket said, we don't have anything for six weeks. They're going to, they're going to have to, we thought y'all were surely, you know, y'all were going to have to wait there until they got, he cleared that docket. Yeah. And, did. and got it 
And he was so furious with. And if you know my dad. mother, you know why he cleared the docket. <laughs> <laughs> He's talking all about the Hague Convention. <laughs> it it was a miracle and it was beautiful and it was amazing. And we got, you know, we you you were in your nightgown. They gave us grace to go and buy you some clothes and um and go. We I I you sent that picture and I I'm gonna post it on the Facebook or um or somewhere wherever I can find a play, place that I didn't end up getting it on the, the Zoom screen here, but you, we're just walking down the street with a little Bobby walking along with us and uh, amazing, yeah. miraculous story. And we got, we got you and we got you home and you had turned 12 on that birthday that I should have, yes. we should have had you by. So from seven to for three full years, you were gone. And the beauty of uh, the, the, seeing you and having you back was unbelievable. Mom says I didn't grow an inch while I was gone. She said, when you, I ran down the stairs at Elaine's house, I looked exactly the same as the last time she saw me. So I know you didn't in three years and then you, you made up for it. <laughs> well, I don't know. And no, you saw, I mean, really, you, you, yeah. I called you a waif. You look so small and, you know, frail in a way. And so your psychological, you're seven to 11, though, you know, those are very formative years and you, you were okay. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you're just living your life. You didn't know I didn't what know else was going didn't. on. You didn't know all this drama was going on, but we, mm -hmm. we figured it out yeah. and it was, it was, it was so beautiful having you get back and come to, you know, United States and you had your little British accent. It was so cute. <laughs> Well, thank you for your contribution to my rescue. Well, it means a lot. You know, it, at the time you just do, I mean, I was three months pregnant. It was a, it was, it was a crazy month for me in that yeah. regard, but um, it, it was, it was the highlight, one of the highlights of my life to be able to oh. hold you again. Oh, that's very sweet. So in, in that time frame, because so much has happened since then, right? So that time frame, is there anything you feel compelled to add of, of that story, that missing your sister, uh, not knowing? Um, I mean, I know one Actually, little thing that reminds, I'm remembering is that you complained to your dad one time that your sister had got some new shoes and you hadn't. So um he took that as you were not being treated fairly, or you took that as that. And it's, you know, it's just kids, right? I mean, it wasn't, there was mm -hmm. no preferential treatment over one or the other. It was just something small, but it seemed to uh, be something that made a difference for him to think that you're not, you weren't. You know, I, I've thought a lot about those stories. Um, uh, and it's interesting, our, our disposition, our personalities. Uh, so I actually didn't know that story about the shoes, but it does sound like something I would have said. Um, but what I did do, what I do remember doing, um, and the reason I remember this is because it was so conse consequential uh, in my mind, not in reality, was I called him a week or two within the first, a few weeks before he came to Texas and took me and said, we didn't have any food in the house. In reality, we obviously had food in the house. We just didn't have the food I wanted. Um, <laughs> and what that did for me was really made it very easy for me to blame myself for what had happened. Um, and so, you know, that's just, it, it's one of the reasons I'm writing a book on self-forgiveness is that some of us are just, we're wired that way. We're wired to to take a uh, hundred percent responsibility when that's just not the way life works. Um, you know, especially just, when you're a child, I mean, you, yeah. You just, and also you're... just to be clear. So I thought a lot about like, so the, one of the stories is that he was obsessed with education and he took me so that I could get a better education. And that's a pretty defensible argument. The education is definitely better there. There is no question about it. But the question then is, well, why didn't they ever have a conversation about a boarding school in the United States or school in Massachusetts? Or why did he wait until then? And the only real answer to that is 
he was just doing what he wanted to do. He was, he, it wasn't about education. It wasn't about my well-being. It was a, probably about getting back at my mother. Um, if, if we're just being honest about the type of person that he was. So really, it wasn't about me at all. <laughs> um, and most not- things rarely, I mean, everybody does what they do. Yeah. And they don't do what they don't do. And, and so often it's not about anything else. It's just yes. what they do. And so that's, uh, that's a big deal. So here we are. We're, we have, it's 25 after, you know, this goes so fast. So we need to shift into, okay. because that was amazing. And you came back and you became a beautiful, wonderful child. And then, and, uh, grew and and blossomed and until you didn't and then you kind of went on a destructive path maybe yes for sure I didn't want to say one more thing because we were talking about the Hague Convention a minute ago so the the way we ended up getting y'all ended up getting me back is Alexander Haig and Jim Wright who was a speaker of the house at the time and out of Fort Worth I think uh, they contacted the U.S. Embassy in London Uh, and facilitated getting me a passport. uh, And I still have that passport. So that was a huge piece. So thank you for remembering that because I, I mean, I met Jim Wright later uh, a few years ago and, uh, and I just thanked thanked him then. Yes, he's passed away, but I thanked him personally way back then a few years Mm -hmm. ago. So uh, yeah, wow. That is a huge thing. So yeah, the passport was a big deal. You can get, I mean, even it yeah. wasn't as much security back then, but you still had to have a passport to travel. Yeah. And so that was, ble- that was a big blessing. And another funny thing, um, cause I have a lot of the documentation from that, that time, uh, we flew back. So we went to court on the fifth and we flew back on the sixth and on the seventh, the court released us. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. And I contacted mom, sent her a letter and said, you're free to leave the country. And we'd already been like a week. <laughs> yeah, it was a big yeah. deal in, in Houston that there was news media and interviews and all kinds of stuff. It was a big yeah. story. And yeah, I have all those newspaper clippings. Or wow. something. It was amazing and still is. And to to know the person you've become because you did self-destruct for a while and yeah let's talk about that yeah so along the way you think you've to blame for everything and nowhere is perfect but yeah yeah so I do want to say that while the kidnapping and the experience is there and my dad was also abusive um fundamentally changed me in adverse ways there's no question about it um my experience when I got back was also very challenging. And I I think that was a consequence of the time as much as anything else, you know, um, understanding trauma and how to treat trauma and how, uh, and the needs of a traumatized child and like that traumatized. We just, I don't think we understood those things back then. Certainly uh, in in our family, we didn't. Um, Thank goodness we do now. And the you know, our, our kids and our grandkids can do better. Um, so, you know, it, it was, it was a series of unfortunate events, even after I got back, unfortunately. And, you know, um, a kid that doesn't get their needs met, they either do one of two things. They either just kind of disappear, you know, from the world, kind of close in on themselves. And that's a certain uh, type of person or they just tried to burn everything to the ground. And that's the kind of person I am. <laughs> scorch, scorch the earth. That's right. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of compassion for that. I'm sorry for, you know, the impact on, on my mother in particular, in particular, and obviously my son when he was in the world. Um, but, uh, but I also have total compassion for why I was that way. And in some ways it was inevitable. Um, so it sucks, but uh, yeah, it just it just was the way I responded. Well, and your dad was had a very fiery temper, if I remember. Oh yeah, yeah. Although very my large personality and fiery fiery temper. <laughs> oh, a brutal temper. Both my parents have huge tempers. I think mom's has waned a lot, but hers wasn't as bad as his. But yeah, I definitely inherited his his temper. Although I don't mean that I I was angry. Uh, like aggressive that way. I mean, I just 
tried to deconstruct everything around me uh, by getting into drugs. And um, I eventually became homeless um, and had a very near fatal addiction. In fact, you saw me um, towards the end of that. Um, in fact, you know, you were there for me during that time in a really uh, special kind of way, uh, um, in a way that just was, you know, everybody was so paralyzed by fear for my death, uh, which was, you know, just a matter of time. Um, and for the destruction that I was causing that they just, they didn't know what to do. But you stayed present, interestingly enough, and opened your home to me at one point. And, you know, you came to visit me when I got arrested. And, you know, you just were always kind. And I, that, that has never been lost on me. It's a special gift that you have to be present when there's so much suffering. So thank you for that. Oh, well, thank you. You know, uh, you just do what you do. <laughs> and I was, yeah. uh, I'm grateful that, that I could help if there was, if that was help, you know, I just, you difference. know, it's just, just love people without judgment with, I mean, just love really people do. and the harder people they are, are to love the more they need it. There's my, it's very, very true. There's a part of my caveat there. And, and that doesn't, and that makes it hard. Yeah, but it was you were I, I you. I never a, gave it. I never gave up on you. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Mm. And then you. Uh, so at that point, you went to a really, really low destructive place. Yeah, uh, let me tell you, man. It's really hard to kill yourself. <laughs> 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 like just like you know. It's, if it isn't your time, it's not, you're not going. It's not your time, it's not your time. That's just <laughs> all, you know, and there's some tenderness to be, you know, if somebody were to choose to believe that for themselves, there's some real tenderness in it for people that they may have lost. Um, but yeah, I tried really hard and it just didn't work. And then um, my son said, and in fact, interestingly enough, and we don't really ever talk about this stuff, it's been lifetimes ago now. But just yesterday, we were talking about this, and he said three words to me. He said, I need you. And, um, you know, again, I really was trying to remove myself from the situation because I always thought I was making things worse. That was sort of, you know, I wasn't there because I thought I wasn't wanted. <laughs> Um, which is a consequence of the kidnapping because that's what uh, my father told me. So and, until he said that to me so clearly, um, I thought he was better off without me. And uh, in that moment, literally everything changed. Not only did that happen, but um, somebody that I, I knew tried to kill me. <laughs> so um, those two events happened uh, within a, a couple months of each other. And So the first event you're talking about when your dad said something... No, my dad wasn't in the picture at this point. Okay. Uh, the man that I was um, with at the time uh, almost killed me. Mm -hmm. He strangled me until I went unconscious. Um, <clears throat> and that sort of kicked something in, in me that, and then a few months after that, uh, I overheard a conversation uh, in which he tried to sell me uh, to somebody else, to another man. Um, and that event and... Uh, my son asked, telling me that he needed me all happened in a, a very short period of time. And I packed up my car left and everything changed. <laughs> Seriously, too. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So when you said at first, the first time you said, he said, I needed you, you, you had mentioned yesterday, he said, y'all, but that y'all, yesterday you were talking, bringing up that same conversation from before that I got a little confused there. So yeah, I want to clarify that, that he's yes. the one that said, I need you years ago. Yes. Yeah. When he, he was, was still talking a child. About Cause he, he said something along the lines of, um, he didn't believe that anybody else could make a difference in somebody's addiction until they're ready. And I said, that's not true because his three words changed everything for me. 
and you must have been ready in a way too. So, or that, who knows? Um, I'll just say here that normally uh, the show goes around 30 minutes and we can open it up to q and We've got a couple of guests on here. If they, it, it would be, if you have any questions or comments and you want to put them in the Zoom chat, we can uh, look at that as we go, as we wind up your side of the story, because we do want to get to the power of forgiveness, which is, you know, which we've been talking about the whole time, but your book and your, um, your, you know, the, the very top line of your book, if I, of your back cover of your book, and it was, it was written by uh, the founder of the Project Forgive, uh, there's nothing that can't be forgiven. And that's a, that's a bold statement. That's right. Um, and so when you recognize, <laughs> I can't get it right there. Yeah. Um, and you have created the Forgiveness Academy. Mm -hmm. and you've facilitated and I've witnessed some of it the some of the workshops and things around around that subject that literally have you know cliche change people's lives but it's changed people's lives absolutely your message your presentation your heart centeredness makes an impact that is is palpable I mean it's just really tremendous the the person you've become and everybody has a story in this little series I'm kind of doing about people telling their story and overcoming yes. and it is it it's to ultimately offer hope offer hope to people that there is there's very few things that you can't overcome if you choose and it, uh, you said choice earlier it's all choice too no I don't think if I said choice I I I I, I think we make choices uh, that have an impact but I do think that's that it's more than that um you know we we can't uh we live in a world <laughs> and that world whether we like it or not uh, affects us and some of us in really profound ways um, and, you know, sometimes, yes, choices make a difference, obviously, but sometimes the choices have to be to change our environment or to make, you know, counterintuitive uh, decisions about um, what we need to do to get better. I'll give an example. So one of the most important decisions I ever made was to leave the place I was uh, when I was almost dead. And pretty much everybody universally will tell you, you're gonna take the problem with you. So I think the most important thing to do is to listen to yourself. Don't listen to the cliches in the world, you know, live with no regrets is another ridiculous example. You know, that's just not reality unless you've lived in a bubble your whole life. It's, a, it's, a, it's an affirmation, I do get that, that we're trying to affirm that we're not going to let regret define us. But regret is a valid human experience and it's a great teacher. Um, we just can't let us let it stop us from moving forward. So anyway, it's more than just choice. And I like to say, I like to make sure that's that's clear because people can feel like they're choosing for years. They keep choosing and they keep choosing and they keep choosing and it still isn't making a difference. And I just have so much compassion for that struggle, for the reality of the complexity of what it takes to find our own joy. Um, and yeah, sometimes there's more to it than just one big choice. I like to think uh, and and I, you know, I don't, I'm not minimizing that even a little bit, but, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, I, any course. given part of my message too, is like every second we get to we are, we are making a choice to take this step or that step. And we don't, we don't recognize that so often cumulatively that I'm taking a breath right now. I'm provided for, I have a choice now to take a go left or go right. And most of the time we can't, if you're in a, in a dark place, you can't see the, the light place to go. Yes. Yes. I think we just have a little bit of a philosophical you know, divergence there, because I don't think 
I think usually what we choose is 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 what we would have inevitably chosen based on everything that happened before it. <laughs> I don't think we're really consciously making choices like we think we are. Uh, <laughs> that makes sense. It really makes sense. Um, I, I I recently thought about a, a little analogy that I really like, um, and I like to think of healing as like dew drops rather than a thunderstorm. So people really like to think that they can wash away trauma and mistakes and that, it, you know, just grand gestures make will make a difference. And that's just not the way healing happens. Healing happens one little drop at a time. So, no so say what. more, say more about that because I believe you've you've mastered and nobody gets there probably ever, but you've mastered this forgiveness piece. And, and I think it's off often, um, it's, it's a cliche, the forgiveness. Oh, we, oh yeah. You got to yeah. forgive. And, and I it think is, people yeah. kind of brush it off as like, oh yeah, yeah. But I, I could never forget, you know, are you kidding yeah. me? They did that, you know, whatever. And you have created healing and wholeness from destruction I mean you literally took yeah. the steps and made the made the did the work yes. and it was and, and it was work re, to become as resilient as you are yes you know when you see a path forward you take it one little step at a time and when you don't you just breathe in this too shall pass you know that's that's it. It's not, it's not a magic potion. It's just not being attached to the suffering that you're experiencing, not believing any story that says it's inevitable or um, unfixable. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you question every story that limits you, that creates suffering for you or for the people around you, and I mean question it to yourself, not necessarily out loud, because uh, everybody's journey is their own. Um, inevitably, that's what life is. It is change. It is shift. You know, one thing happens and then the other thing happens. And if we're not attached to the present circumstances, um, life will present other opportunities. You said, I relentlessly forgave. That was part of your, I mean, that was a relentless is a big word. Relentlessly forgave, not only uh, well, everything in your life, right? So you started transforming because you started that choosing. If that was a choice to for, start forgiving and figuring out what that meant for you, right? You know, my experience uh, when I first um, started a recovery journey, and I don't mean that synonymously with a 12-step program. I mean, recovery from, you know, the hard things that have happened in life which we're all on a journey of recovery, if you think about it. Um, exactly. You know, if I felt that rage and that resentment, and most of the resentment was aimed towards my mother, interestingly enough, and there's a, there, there, there's a lot of research in psychology for why that is. Um, when I felt that experience, what I mean by relentless is every time it happened, I redirected I redirected, I redirected, I redirected, I questioned, I redirected, I questioned. Because at first it can just feel impossible. You know, it's just like, this is, I'm just steeped in rage and resentment and shame. And it's my whole experience. And the only thing I know to do is escape. I tried all the ways that you can escape. I tried desperately to kill myself, not only through addiction, but actively multiple times. And I just failed at everything else. So it's not like I had some sort of amazing revelation. I just tried everything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, well, well, thank you. I mean, I'm just like, thank you. And then you, all, you also said in one of, uh, I vowed not to live a tragic life. So when you, vow when you shift and I will not live a tragic life that was that was a shift right that you had to make that mental shift into I I want to die and but and then you said if I'm not going to die I'm going to not going to live a tragic life is that kind of right 
Yeah, it is. You know, part of that experience was recognizing, again, sort of the, interestingly enough to bring it back full circle, the familial impact of my story. So it was a tragedy. And that, it, it, the things that happened in my childhood, and in some ways that became a part of my story just naturally. Uh, and I embodied it. I really lived a sense that anything that didn't go to shit was good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> a miracle, you know? Um, and so recognizing that that expectation of tragedy was a part of sort of the fabric of who I was, uh, was really, it was a powerful shift um, to get to choose it. Now, again, to go back to choice, I did make that initial choice, but I still make that choice. Um, that fabric is still a part of who I am. I just have to wake up every day and, and decide how much I'm going to live it. And when I do live it, um, to just breathe that, breathe in that presence and still have compassion for myself. I love the compassion for yourself because so many of us tend to be so hard on ourselves. Yeah, why did I do that? And you know, whatever, and just live with the grace, right? And and another thing, I I just pointing out things that I remember or saw that you have written, and you believe as we heal, the world heals. So, you know, when I when I buy a candy bar for for somebody, I believe that and give them a hug or offer a hug or an elbow bump, whatever, you know, the energy shifts. Right. And so Absolutely. I think that's what you're talking about here, that as we, as our energy rises, the world, it, it apparently anytime you ratchet up your energy, it, it really affects thousands and thousands of people energetically yeah. in the world. Is that, yeah, I, I, by I, that? I think that's, 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 I don't, you know, I don't know the extent of the impact, but I do think it makes a difference when I don't think we'll ever know the extent till, you know, some, you know, there's something called a Bema that I saw. It was a religious thing, but it was, you know, every person that you impacted that impacted others, they all stand up in, <laughs> in judgment day or whatever. And, and you had no idea and you yeah. could never follow that chain. But I believe that when we choose yes. make, to, to choose joy, to choose to love people around us, even if they're hard to love, you know, it, it, it impacts more than just us. Yeah. Tell me your favorite quote. So we were, you were. Uh, oh, my favorite like, quote is uh, whoever can see, see through fear will always be safe. It's from the Tao Te Ching which I read every day for about 18 months, a few years ago. Uh, it's, yeah. it's hard to get through, but that's, that's huge. So yeah. can, what um, can you, what does that mean for you? Whenever you, whoever can see through fear? Um, what it means is that the fear is an illusion. Um, you know, if you can see the sky through the clouds, um, then you can see what's actually true. Um, so that's beautiful truly um so we we're down to the last 10 minutes here i can't believe and so i if anybody anybody that's on live wants to put into the chat uh emily's offering a free audio book to send to you so it put your email put yes i want the book in the zoom chat um and your email address and we will send she will send you a free audio book of the power of forgiveness, a huge gift for you and yours. And, uh, and if you're listening on the replay, which more people will direct message me, Charla, Charla, Charla Anderson.com. And I will get that book. Yeah. I will have her, I will share that with her. So, does that make sense? Did that make sense? <laughs> that made perfect sense. Okay. So if you want a free audio book of the power of forgiveness from Emily J. Hooks. You want to listen please. to this voice for 10 hours. Oh, is it 10 hours? Mm. I don't know how long it is. Maybe it's probably six hours. But you sat there. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a commitment. It's quite a process. And I love when people do their own audio books. Yeah. yeah. My, my little book is 20, 
five minutes, <laughs> 25 oh, minutes, and it seemed nice. like long. It's sweet it really is. <laughs> Short and sweet, right? But <laughs> if so as we move forward, if if um, if any you, anyone yeah. chooses, if you listens to this at any point, and we're still kicking, we'll be happy to send you an audio book of this amazing book. And once you get connected with Emily, your website is emilyjhooks.com. So there is, is. an amazing, a beautiful website. Yeah. Uh, what's on there? A contact form. If somebody wanted yeah. to reach out to me, they can. I'm working on a workbook called The Grudge Detox. I think that's uh, really needed right now, post-pandemic. I think people are just kind of a little grumpy. Um, <laughs> So, I, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a simpler process to kind of let go of those small grievances, although they can have a profound impact on your life. If they, if it's a habit, um, I'm working on that and a course and, and the other books. So stay tuned. Oh man, you, you've got so much. And the, when I mentioned in the beginning, I, I, you're, 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 you have such a soulful, deep, spirit and and such a commitment and conviction to make impact in this world as as uh as you have so often and uh, touched Thank me you. in so many ways i'm i mean I, we don't see each other enough but we will uh, more and uh, the holidays you know gotta never know yeah and gotta show up at the holidays and get good food and that's right. Good family. And <laughs> so things are, things um, are settled. You know, I feel like things are more settled. It's been, it's been a, such a journey and, you know, your, your mom and your sister, I mean, ultimately the family is, is Healed. doing well and really fun, fun. Yes. There's a lot of fun now in this, in this family, in this environment. And uh, uh I'm grateful yeah. for you for all of that. So mm -hmm. tell us, you know, your biggest, most important message. If there's anything left that you want to share about. You're going to set me up here, huh? So mm -hmm. we have one yeah. more profound statement. <laughs> you're, you're so full of them. You might, we might as well um, embellish them. Gosh, I don't, I don't have another, another. So what's next for Emily besides all these? And will you name the books and the courses that you just rattled off? Uh, so uh, The Grudge Detox will be a workbook. It'll just be free. It'll be available on the website. I'll put it on social media when it's ready. Um, the book will, it's going to be, you know, probably six to 12 months before that's written. Uh, and if you're connected with me any which way, you'll know about its release. That's the um, title of the book that... The working title is "Living with Ourselves." Okay, um, we'll see. And so you're talking. That's the self healing, yeah, uh, forgiving yourself. Yeah, that we talked about in the beginning. Okay. Yeah, and so. the courses and stuff, such. Yeah. So you have the Forgiveness Academy, and you were really doing some amazing things. And you are a speaker, extraordinary speaker, mm -hmm. and you never know when that opportunity comes back again. You know, as and I'm sure you're open to doing that because sure. you truly have a gift. Thank you. You know, one of my favorite things to do is facilitate workshops. Uh, I, lo I love speaking. and um, But what I love about workshops is getting to see that transformation. Um, you know, uh, I did one, actually, I think this the one I was that I'm thinking of was in uh, was in Fort Worth several years ago. And there were several young people in the group, uh, like high school kids. And man, it was so powerful, just like popcorn, watching those transformations and the realizations about how much space we have to choose the relationship that we're going to have to our experiences in the past, you know, and it just so happens that I have some credence, some weight, because my story is so um, wrought with difficulty, <laughs> you know, um, and from such a young age, I mean, then, and if they were teenagers, they, their life is, they're full of stuff, but they're not 30, 50 years of full of stuff. They're well, 18 years full of stuff. They can start looking at it earlier. Yeah, exactly. Isn't it great to realize at such a young age that you have the freedom to choose uh, and do the work of forgiveness if you want to, you don't have to, but if you want to, 
there's a great deal of liberation to be found from the experiences that we wish had been different. Uh, duh. <laughs> we all want it to be sunshine and uh, and you know, Ray, being around my little eighteen month, almost eighteen month old, on a daily basis, and watching, you know, and all we want, all I, I, I want the least painful life for her, and knowing that, how do you do that, right? I mean, babies are such rays of hope and joy and simplicity. I love being around babies for that reason. She certainly is. And I have, uh, I'll just say this. We've got a, just a couple of minutes left. There's, I can't see the name of the person that is on here. Um, if you want to, is it Patty? Oh, is, is it? Oh, hi. Nah, this is Patty Gray. She wrote a book. Okay. I couldn't tell who it was without my looking closer so she's going to be my guest in July 12 she's got a few stories of overcoming so I'm grateful for you to see how it looks from that side because I it's an interesting um, dynamic here so you can unmute if you want to say anything hi Patty can you unmute uh, that's so funny I without my, you know, really looking close. Hi, Patty. Okay. <laughs> Hi, dear. I didn't plan to be on. <laughs> well, it's no all right. It, it's, we're, we're excited to have you and thank you for participating. I, um, I wanted to watch and see, and, and I really enjoyed her, her testimony and everything. So that's great. I look forward to seeing you in July. July 12th, um, Patty Grace or Patricia Sh Shiflet. <laughs> she got, so, and it's just throw out the name of your book real quick. Our, our fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Super. So we'll be looking forward to getting to know you better too in July. Thank 12th. you. So I write for a newspaper, but it's local. Okay. Write, and there's like 40, over 40 articles, but I don't think anybody has access to that. Oh, well, it's good. You're, you're brilliant you. and you've overcome, you're a huge overcomer as well. So, well, we're going to just God kind bless. of, God Thank bless you. you. Thank off. you. And we'll just kind of wind it all down and uh, look for emilyjhooks.com. Look for replays on charlaanderson.com. Uh, I, I put them up there on all over the place, but the simplest place to find them is probably on my website, charlanderson.com. And I, that this show will, should be up by this evening or before. And, um, thank you for having me. Oh, what a, what a, what a blessing and how much grace I feel you've just really exposed. And when we didn't really address something you know we have other family members that I mean even your sister Kathy her perspective of this we probably it didn't occur to me but we probably could have had her in here as a perspective oh, as that well would have been amazing I would have yeah loved maybe we'll try that again sometime because because yeah. her perspective is as you know I'm sure she felt guilty and lost or, or you know something that along all that line question. too so yeah. Uh, we all are just trying to get through life just as best we can and yeah. doing all we know to do with what we have. My little saying, I did what I did. I didn't do what I didn't do. I did all that I knew to do with what I knew at the time, just like you did and are doing in your life right now. I love you. It's kind of call it a forgiveness release. Mm. My blog that I am working to do, I've got daily, uh, monthly, um, sayings of the month or values of the month and i just finished writing the one for june is forgiveness right. <laughs> is the value of the month is forgiveness so this is oh, fitting that. hand in hand for that and we've just got uh so much to share and so much to joy my message nearly always just ends with joy is a choice and choose joy and with that, we'll see you next week on the Charla Anderson Show, Collector and Connector of Fascinating People. And everyone is fascinating. And there's so many blessings to you, Emily. I love you so much. Thank you. Choose joy.